Um, so Deepma, it's 2019, the world feels like it's changing at a rapid pace. Why agroforestry? I mean, you know that we are also in this kind of decade where we're working towards the sustainable development goals, mm -hmm. of which there are 17. Um, and without going too much into detail, agroforestry actually works towards all of these kind of sustainable development goals. So there's a huge opportunity actually to use agroforestry to address certain social issues like poverty and hunger, but also to address issues that have to do with the sustainable management of land, where we have major issues in certain continents and countries in terms of land degradation. So agroforestry is actually also a very good solution to rehabilitate, to restore these kind of lands, generate income for the people who are doing that and contributing all together to the sustainable development goals. Wow, so I mean your work is in value chains, how, what, how, how, what, what do we need to do to make value chains more sustainable? I mean, a value chain exists, as you know, uh, of all the different actors, starting from production, a farmer, if you will, producing certain agricultural crops. Then there might be a certain kind of processing in this kind of value chain. And then that goes into, if it is a long chain, into wholesale, retail, into the consumer. And I think all of these different value chain actors have an important role to play. And I would actually start with the very consumer, so at the backside, if you will, of the value chain. I mean, there is actually one sustainable development goal that is exactly about responsible production and consumption. So if the world altogether moves towards more responsible consumption, that would then provide a very strong signal to all those other value chain actors that are producing actually the raw materials or certain kind of food products or other type of products. And that of course would need to be linked I think to some kind of incentives. Very often we talk about monetary incentives. You could think about certain price premiums that are paid for certain kind of products that have a particularly good environmental footprint, if you will, that also have a social responsibility element linked to it. And that might link actually to certain types of certification systems that would seek to reward that kind of environment and social performance. And then consumers paying for that, that would be a good linkage. So we're seeing more and more consumers are trying to be responsible um, and there's so many labels out there and now we've even got uh, companies that are starting their own labels. Mm. Um, I mean, are we confused? Like, is it, are we helping by, by buying products with, that are labelled? And which label should we look out for? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think it is really confusing. I mean, worldwide, we talk about hundreds, probably already thousands of different labels. And we cannot really expect that consumers would be fully aware what each and every label stands for, how credible it is, the claims that they make in terms of their environmental performance, in terms of the social standards they try to adhere to. So it is quite confusing and what I do observe sometimes is that there is even a further push or drive towards even more and newer labels and I think before we engage in that, I think we should always ask the question first of all, is there a market demand out there for that? And is there also a way that we can communicate that to the consumers or to other actors in the value chain in order to be aware that this label really stands maybe for something different than what is already out there in the marketplace. So yes, we have to watch out that we don't overwhelm actually the consumers. And we've seen the um, Rainforest Alliance recently have announced that they're going to launch a landscape label. Is it just another label on the market or are you seeing a bigger value in that? To start with, I think it is a great idea to think about how you can get to scale. And I think this kind of effort to have like a landscape level certification is interesting because of course you could all of a sudden cover probably tens of thousands of hectares, maybe thousands if not tens of thousands of producers. So I think there, there is a real value from that angle. Now what I rather would expect not being too easy is if a certain landscape is certified and then something goes wrong because certain people in the landscape don't adhere to a certain social environmental standard, what does it mean for the certificate as a whole? Does the whole landscape then lose, if you will, the certificate? Or do you have to expel those people from that kind of landscape? So I think there's a lot of practical issues. I wouldn't be quite clear about how to solve that because we have at lower level something similar in forestry where there's a so-called group certification scheme where several, say, smallholder groups, enterprises can have one joint certificate and it brings down the cost, the level of effort they have to put into that. And at least there it is possible if one of the members doesn't comply with the standard, you kick them out. And then the remaining members still have the group certificate. In a landscape, 
I wouldn't be quite clear how you could use that. Another part is, and, and I think that relates to what is already existing there, something like a denomination of origin, where certain landscapes, like here in France, for instance, we have quite a couple of them, um, they, they have a brand name as, as, as something of their own, and it doesn't really come as a certificate, it's just tagged on the vine or the olives or any kind of other product that comes from here. So I think if you want to use it as a marketing tool, then you can use already existing systems like denomination of origin. If it is more to introduce certain environmental social standards at the landscape level, then we have to see what you do with those who are not able and or not willing to comply with those standards. I think that's a really good point. I mean, how do smallholders even sign up to those labels? Is it practical? Well, the point from a smallholder perspective is, is um, it's, it's many different aspects they would have to, to think about. First of all, what does the label mean in terms of what they are allowed to do and what they are not allowed to do? Think of a organic certification. They cannot use synthetic fertilizers. They cannot use agrochemicals. So that might bring down their productivity unless they have very good organic management procedures in place. So there's a capacity building element linked to that. Another element is, I think, the costs. For an individual smallholder, most of the certification costs are prohibitive. So you have to think about the level of aggregation where then, say, smallholder enterprises like cooperatives, farmers associations, would have a certain label and that extends to their members, to the smallholders, and then the cost can be shared by maybe hundreds or even thousands of smallholders. So you address the cost issue. But I think it's equally important when you have this level of aggregation like a smallholder enterprise, that also helps to market later on the products. I mean, each and every smallholder marketing on their own, the relatively little volume yeah. they have, that doesn't really give them a strong position in the value chain. But if you bulk that at the level of a cooperative or a farmers association or another smallholder run enterprise, then you have a much stronger actually position in the value chain that has another, I think, advantage. And that can be very well linked to certification, but you need to go to that level beyond the individual smallholder farm. Is that an opportunity for NGOs and other civil society organizations to play a role in, in grouping those cooperatives Definitely together? Definitely there is. The uh, point is it takes very long and, and we did a study right. actually a few years ago for an international foundation and it was about global review of rural community enterprises and we had community enterprises from the agricultural sector, from forestry, from tourism, rural uh, community-based tourism and we found out that on average and you might be surprised it took them 40 years plus, four zero years plus to become mature, to become relatively independent from NGO support, from, from projects, from wow. donations. And that means it's a very, very long time span. That doesn't mean you couldn't cut it shorter. You're pretty sure that if there's a clear strategy and approach it, you can probably get it back to something like 10 years or so. But still, it's 10 years to get these, call it rural community-based enterprises, more or less to a level of being self-sufficient and that means that very often since we are living in, in a time where each and everyone is supposed to have impact on a very short term two or three year projects and then the world already needs to be a better place which is good in terms of the level of ambition but to show that with unorganized smallholders that after two three years something is dramatically different is not an easy one this is where you need these kind of organizations the smallholder run enterprises but very often there is then kind of a self-selection of the ngos and the projects they go where these organizations already exist because then they don't start from scratch and then they can show in a shorter period of time the kind of impact that they, maybe their funders, their donors are expecting. But that is a trouble that leaves outside all those who are not organized. And on a worldwide scale among smallholders, we estimate that anything between 80-90% are not organized. So you don't want to leave them behind. You have to focus specifically on these, but then the funders, the donors, the investors need to be realistic that that is a much longer investment period that is needed to have a constant support to those groups to really become mature. And it's that, you know, money's always the root of, of, uh, of all our problems and answers, as some might argue. And is that what we're seeing here? Well, here, what I definitely hear in this Congress is there's a very clear consensus that whatever we do needs an integrated approach. And integrated means bringing together biophysical, environmental elements, social elements, economic elements. I think I, I've also heard it very much. 
that everyone please for cross-sector collaboration so government working with NGOs NGOs working with private sector private sector working with government I think we are very clear on that um, I think we are also very clear about the magnitude of the challenge that is out there I think we are also very clear about the solutions that we have to offer everyone is aware that whatever solution they are working on is only part of a bigger picture of a set of solutions but I haven't heard so much I have heard it but not so much about this time horizon and particularly that we need very long periods of time and that we then have an institutional framework and that includes also investors and funders who are with us for that long period of time and I guess at the moment like the problems feel so large I mean we're facing climate change more recently and um, biodiversity has been thrust into the limelight and actually how serious that is and we're starting to well the public now is starting to learn more about uh, soil health and the impact mm. that's going to have on food security so what role do you see big business playing in helping us combat these challenges I mean, big business definitely has a huge role to play. And if you were just to take the cocoa sect and then say chocolate manufacturers um, as, as the big business, this is a hundred billion dollar business or so, yeah? um, involving anything between five and six million smallholder households. So if you count five members roughly per household, that's 25, 30 million people directly depending on cocoa production. So there's already a linkage, I think, in this sense. Um, and that means we, we have to find a way where the revenues that are generated by, by the big business, that part of that is reinvested. And I think reinvested not only in terms of paying, in this case, the price of cocoa at the farm gate, but also reinvesting in the cocoa production system. And that gets us back to agroforestry. We would think that a cocoa-based agroforestry system is actually both in the interest of the smallholder, because there might be shade trees that produce certain fruits, maybe fuel wood, maybe timber, that actually also protect to a certain extent the cocoa harvest. It automatically means that these smallholders can sell different types of products from the same production system. It is definitely more resilient in terms of um, climate, climate change, climate variability. So it should actually be the, also the very interest of the chocolate industry that in addition to cocoa that they are buying from those systems, that that helps to stabilize actually the overall production system and I would say the livelihood system of the farmers that are producing the cocoa. We do see certain initiatives already coming up. Definitely some of those businesses are further down the road. There's an overall commitment of the chocolate industry to get the cocoa sector sustainable by the year 2020. It's just around the corner. Yeah. We have different definitions of sustainability. Uh, probably here in this kind of event, we have a very broad definition of sustainability, environmental, social, economic factors. Sometimes the view of, of big business might be, well, it's about sustainable sourcing. And that means ensuring certain levels of volumes and quality over a longer period of time. But that's probably a pretty narrow definition of sustainability. Others are aware that you have to go beyond that to ensure that really the livelihood systems are more sustainable over time. And what we would like to see, and we see something emerging, but it, it still needs to gain more momentum, are investments in rejuvenating, for instance, cocoa-based agroforestry systems, a real investment on, on the part of the industry there. And that goes beyond the cocoa. You need really this more integrated agroforestry system so we're moving in the right direction do we move at the right speed I don't think so we have to accelerate that uh, we have to get more into that and sometimes I would like to think if you think of again the cocoa market is a concrete example I mean the world market price for cocoa has come down over the last two years or so and that essentially is a savings on the part of the big business because mm -hmm. that kind of lower cocoa price it's not passed on easily to the consumer that your chocolate product that you get here in the supermarket is cheaper. So there's some kind of savings. And I would like to think that part of that money, of course they need it for other parts of the business, that's for sure, and reinvesting also in processing plants, etc. But I would love to think that part of these savings, simply because of a lower cocoa price, are reinvested at the farm level in these more long-term oriented, more sustainable cocoa-based agroforestry systems.